Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? Oh, I'm great. Did you have a Felice Navi dad? I did. We appreciate uh, everyone tuning in with us. Christmas just a couple of days ago. Did you guys have a, uh, this is your first Christmas in Connecticut in decades, right? I, it was, and it was a good one. Had uh, the entire family here, so that's always nice. And Santa Claus, I think, was good to everybody, and everybody got what they wanted. So it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Well, and everybody is going to get what they wanted. If you were still hanging in there to hear Armageddon 99, it's coming your way. We uh, we're planning on dropping it to you very, very soon. But first, our topic at hand today is the one and only Jimmy Hart, the mouth of the South. Uh, this guy has been a part of wrestling my entire life. It feels like he's been everywhere. And I mean, this episode could be 38 hours long, but we're going to hit the high points today, but what a career he's had without question, a hall of famer and, and maybe one of the more talented people in the history of professional wrestling, because before he had success in wrestling, he had success in the music business, right? Bruce. Hey, Hey, it's the gentries. As a matter of fact, he did. Jimmy is one of those well-rounded, extremely talented on every level guys that you'd ever want to meet. We, uh, we agree on that. I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating how much he's contributed to the music behind the scenes, but we'll start at the beginning. Jimmy, can you sing the song? Do you know the song? The Gentry's hit that he had? Yes. No, but you want Keep to keep on dancing. That's kind of how it goes. That's about all I know of it too. Oh, but I know it as soon as it comes on, I go, oh my God, that's the Gentry. So that's Jimmy Hart, man. Keep on dancing, baby. Well, check it out. Uh, keep on dancing. The reason we're covering him now is because, uh, next week he's got a big birthday. Uh, January 1st, 1943. He was born in Jackson, Mississippi. Jimmy Hart, by the way, is his real name. Ray is his middle name. He moves to Memphis when he's a little kid and uh, goes to school there, goes to the same high school that Jerry Lawler went to, in fact. And Jimmy's a few grades ahead of Jerry, and they didn't really know each other there. But he even played sports, which, giving a small frame, you wonder, what would that be? How about wide receiver, uh, which I guess is uh, maybe a suitable deal. He's going to start selling concessions uh, in the 1950s at the Ellis Auditorium. And he's at the famous Billy Wicks Sputnik Monroe match in 1957 that held the attendance record in Memphis for decades. So he's around sort of the show business, uh, and, and, and for that matter, even wrestling at a very early age, some of our younger listeners may not be familiar with Sputnik Monroe. Tell everybody about this landmark performer and this match in particular. Sputnik was one of the all time, first of all, he's a great heel, but also Sputnik was most famous for not wrestling in the South unless they allowed back in the day, colored people to come in. So Sputnik did not believe in segregation. Sputnik would not wrestle unless everyone was allowed to come in and see him wrestle. And Sputnik would go and Sputnik would visit the black part of town and drink in their bars and have dinner. But there was no prejudice in Sputnik Monroe. There was no, he, he didn't see other than he felt everyone should be treated equally. And he refused. He was such a draw and so powerful in the South with being such a great draw that promoters in that day, Sputnik was so far ahead of his time that promoters would have, hey, on segregated shows, everyone's welcome. Come on in to see your hero, Sputnik Monroe. And Sputnik drew tremendous crowds in the South, and he was just so far ahead of his time in everything that he did. I mean, there, the Jerry Lawler used to, to talk about, he goes, you know, the African-American folks in Tennessee had – picture of Jesus Christ, Martin Luther King and Sputnik Monroe in their houses. It's a big deal, uh, that Sputnik, you know, did what he did in Memphis. And that's cool that, you know, their big match in 57, that set the attendance record, uh, was actually one that was, was intact until the Monday night war. So 
quite a while. Uh, eventually he would see an advertisement for a talent show type of deal. Almost like, uh, I guess, uh, an America's got talent or a star search of the era. And he forms a band and they're originally called the gents, but an agency that started booking them in local shows told them the names, the gents didn't sound like a good name. So eventually they became the gentries. <laughs> and, uh, I believe the inspiration for that was a condom machine on the wall. So there you go. That's wrestling. Um, pretty big deal. R E S S L I N that's wrestling. Pretty big deal because uh, as teenagers, Jimmy, uh, as part of this group signs a deal with uh, MGM records. And, uh, this is just tremendous. When you think about, you know, that this guy has been in the right place at the right time, his whole career, including in music. And that song actually did really well for him. Uh, it's a seven member group. They're all from Treadwell high school. Started playing together in 63 at high school dances, win the Memphis battle of the bands in 64. They lead to, uh, get, get a, a contract with, uh, Youngstown records. Pretty impressive that they're able to uh, pull all this together. Keep on dancing that you mentioned in 1965, went to number four on the billboard charts. And he even had appearances on where the action is, which was Dick Clark's show in the sixties. And that was the springboard to national exposure, of course. And they would even go on tour with the beach boys and Sonny and Cher. Uh, the other singles that they would have released would fail to crack the top 40. So their success is relatively short lived. And the last, uh, sort of hallmark of, of this group was an appearance in the 1967 movie bikini world. And then they would fold later in 67. He would bring them back in 69 and he becomes the lead singer in 70. They had a couple of singles crack the top 100. Why should I cry and cinnamon girl. They broke up for good in 72, but somewhere in there, they're in the studio and they get a call from Jim Blake, who was a friend of Jerry Lawler's. And he told Jimmy, they were going to get a cut up. They were going to cut a song on Jerry Lawler called stormy weather and asked Jimmy, if he'd want to be a part of it. And Jimmy was a huge wrestling fan growing up. So he jumped at the chance. And before you know it, uh, Jerry's coming to the studio to work with the gentries. And of course, as they're all passing around the booze, Jimmy and Jerry realized neither one of them drink either. And, uh, then they start passing around marijuana and they both passed and Hey, turns out they're both, uh, I guess straight edge before that was a thing and wrestling fans. These guys became fast friends. Well, I know what side of the couch I'd have been on, on both of those. <laughs> yeah. Just I, saying I would have been on the drinking side. You would have been on the puff, puff pass side and somewhere in the middle, uh, there are Jerry and Jimmy. Isn't that a weird way for this pairing to come about? You know, that somebody had the idea to have Lawler come in and cut a song and Jimmy just happens to be the guy right place, right time again. Yeah, it is. And I think that, you know, as I like to say a lot of times, God makes them and he pairs them. And Jerry Lawler and Jimmy Hart at this point here was their moment of infamy where they met each other and in many ways became inseparable throughout the rest of their lives. Um, obviously, both gone their separate ways and done different things, but run, ran along that same parallel in the wrestling business and in life in many ways. We should mention that, uh, later Jerry would lose a retirement match against handsome Jimmy Valiant. And after that attendance would start to drop off. So Jerry Jarrett, uh, calls Jimmy and says, Hey, we've got an idea of how to get Jerry Lawler back into wrestling. We want Jimmy to bring the gentries to the arena and have Jerry join the group and go on tour with them for a few months. And when the gentries came to the arena, Jerry performed with them and Valiant came out and pushed members of the gentries around and hit Jerry over the head with a guitar and that gets Jerry back into the storyline and wrestling again. As you can imagine, Jimmy and Jerry form a fast friendship and six months later, uh, that's when, uh, Lawler gets the call to say, Hey, will you do some promotional work? And, uh, since Jimmy had some time off with the gentries, he accepted the offer. So he starts doing promotions for their Memphis promotion and even occasionally doing a little ring announcing. And, and one day Lawler tells Jimmy, he wants to rent out a theater and do a concert. And it was the same theater that Elvis would rent out whenever he had private parties. And eventually Jerry would turn heel and ask Jimmy if he wants to be his manager. And of course, Jimmy agrees to do that. 
But Jimmy's first match as a manager is as a manager of Jerry Lawler, as Lawler's taken on his longtime mem- Memphis nemesis, Bill Dundee. And during the match, Jimmy's supposed to throw a chain to Jerry, but no one tells him that he's just supposed to lob it uh, so the fans could see. So instead, Jimmy throws it hard to Jerry, and it went past Jerry and lands on the rope and wraps around it. Pretty fun to think about the humble beginnings of, even if you're a wrestling fan, the little nuanced stuff is on the job training in this era, is it not? Sure it is, because there were times that they would bring people into the business and never smarten them up. They would keep them separate from the boys, and they would just tell them just as much as they needed to know. And they weren't always told the whys and the whats and the wheres. They were just told specifically, here, do this at this time. And everything else was left up to them to figure out. So it wasn't uncommon for a guy to be, just be told, okay, come down to the ring, stand in the corner, don't move until I tell you this. When I tell you this, do it. And that's all you knew going in. Gino Hernandez, you know, would talk about Jose Lothario sending him to Louisiana to do television for the first time, and he didn't didn't know what the hell he was supposed to do. He had worked with Jose, and Jose had taught him how to work and different things, but didn't smarten him up. My brother Tom, the first time he he was in the ring with Skandor Akbar, he's like, you know, Liz has his own his own kid, and Tom's like, what? didn't have a clue what the hell he was saying until finally Akbar yanked him by the hair and said, go home. And that's a tough way to learn a lesson, but that's how you learned back in the day, trial and error on the job. Well, that carries over even to wrestling the next week. Uh, Dundee brings in an enhancement talent named Pat Hutchinson who hadn't won a match on TV in two years. And He challenges Jimmy to wrestle him and Jimmy's going to wear Lawler's wrestling gear and wrestle him. And Jerry said, it looked like Jimmy had been wrestling for two years. He did so well. And of course, Jimmy would attribute this to being such a big fan and watching it so intently growing up, but there you go. He finds himself in the ring wrestling, uh, fast forward. And one day Lawler suffers a broken leg playing football with his buddies, but with Lawler down the care the territory has to carry on. So to start his upcoming feud with Jerry, Jimmy would say on a promo that when a horse breaks his leg, you shoot it. And he proclaims Paul Ellering as the new king of wrestling. And now Jimmy Hart is going to be the leader of the first family. And of course, when Jerry comes back, he accidentally breaks Jim, uh, Jimmy's jaw in two places, hitting him with a punch. And Jerry says it happens because he hadn't thrown a punch in nine months. And well, his timing was a little off. And when Lawler returned from that injury, he's of course going against Jimmy and the first family. And it's one of the big successful boom periods in Tennessee history. And during this period, Jimmy would produce and sing the song Lance Russell's nose, which got a lot of airplay on local Memphis radio stations and was remade into the song Barbara Streisand's nose that Terry Funk sang in Japan in the early eighties on his album. Um, this is the boom period of Memphis wrestling sort of, I I know you do the impression a lot here, but explain to some of our younger fans who Lance Russell was. Lance Russell was the quintessential Memphis wrestling play by play announcer. Lance was the one in front of the camera. Welcome everyone to Memphis championship. Come on, Lawler. Come on out. Say what you gotta say. And Lance Russell was the face that everyone saw every single Saturday afternoon or every Saturday morning, if you will, on channel five. And they trusted Lance. If it came out of Lance Russell's mouth, then it was the gospel. So Lance was probably more aligned with wrestling than anyone else in the promotion and was arguably the biggest star next to Jerry Lawler in the entire Memphis wrestling promotion. It's hard to argue that, um, one of the things that everybody remembers about Jimmy is the Andy Kaufman bit. But before we do there, before we get there, we should mention that there's a young guy named Jim Cornette, who's doing photography and trying to get in the business as a manager. And Jimmy would be very influential 
on this young Jim Cornette's early days in the business, as far as giving him advice and letting him borrow gear when he needs. Did you ever, I mean, you were tight with Corny for a long time. Did you ever have conversations about how important Jimmy Hart was to his early days? Without a doubt, because Jimmy is Jimmy Hart is what Jim Cornette aspired to be. Right. And Jimmy Hart was the bad guy wrestling manager in Memphis television. And he was the only one there for a long time, other than Sam Bass, who who had come before, who had managed Jerry Lawler for a long time there. But Jimmy Hart was the loud mouth, weaselly manager that Cornette, that that's who he idolized. And that is what he saw himself doing. So when the opportunity arose, that's what Cornette patterned himself after in many ways. After a while, Cornette came into his own, did the tennis racket, my mommy's rich and, and what have you. Um, but it was, it was based on Jimmy Hart and Jimmy Hart was one of the best regional managers that has ever been. And one of the best managers of all time, you know, when he went national, he was able to hold his own and, and make a name for himself. Well, of course, uh, the thing that people think about the most, probably from the mainstream, when you think about angles in Memphis, it's all about Andy Kaufman and Jimmy is managing Andy Kaufman during that infamous angle with Jerry Lawler. And during that angle, Andy and Jimmy would break up in the storyline and briefly feud against each other before reuniting to continue the feud with Jerry. I mean, such a big moment in wrestling history, Andy Kaufman's involvement. And once again, Jimmy Hart's right in the middle of it. Jimmy was because Jimmy again was the one that was the mainstay in the Lawler antagonist in Memphis. So to align Jimmy Hart and Andy Kaufman together, it helped solidify Kaufman being a heel and it helped the story. I don't think that anybody really believed that Andy Kaufman would be able to do it all on his own, but he did. And, and he was very good at it, but by aligning, him with Jerry Lawler, I mean, with, uh, Jimmy Hart, it was guaranteed. Let's fast forward one day in 1985, Jimmy is sharing a hotel room with Eddie Gilbert and plowboy Frazier and Jimmy calls home and his wife tells him that Vince McMahon had called there and Jimmy told his wife, it's probably Austin Idol pranking him because he does stuff like this all the time, including, you know, an imitation of Jim Barnett and Jimmy said about, uh, uh-huh, my boy. Jimmy says about a week later, his wife tells him that George Scott called for him. But again, Jimmy thinks that's a rib. So the next day they're going to do a show in Lexington, Kentucky, but they get snowed out and hillbilly Jim would call Jimmy who had previously worked in Memphis as Harley Davidson. And Jimmy would tell hillbilly about the phone calls he had gotten. And hillbilly told him that Howard Finkel had been watching tapes of Memphis wrestling and Vince liked Jimmy and wanted to break into the South. And he thought Jimmy could help with that. So hillbilly told Jimmy, he was going to make a call and call him right back. So he makes the call. And when he calls Jimmy back, he says, Vince is going to call you. And Vince called Jimmy and told him they'd love to have him and wanted to know if he'd come to Stanford to meet with him. And Jimmy said, yes. And when he asked when he could come, Vince said, how about tomorrow morning? Jimmy agreed. And Vince then put him in touch with a travel agency to make all of the arrangements. When Jimmy got there, he tells Vince that if he hired him, Vince could depend on him. And Jimmy told him that he doesn't drink and Vince asked, when can you start? Jimmy said, when do you want me to? And Vince said, how about tomorrow? Well, Jimmy told him he was supposed to run TV the upcoming weekend because Lawler was in Japan and Jerry Jarrett was out hunting. And if he doesn't run TV, they wouldn't have anyone to do it. And Vince said he liked that because if you screwed them, you'd screw me. So he told him he was going to start him at a thousand dollars a week until he starts on the road with them and to go ahead and run TV and then come up the next Monday. And I've always been fascinated with stories like this because it does feel like the narrative on Vince McMahon is that he's cutthroat and wants to do whatever he can to the opposition. And there are certainly stories where things like that add up. Where, you know, the rumor in innuendo is that he offered Harley race a bunch of money to no show Starcade, but yet on the other hand, he really respects it when people turn down those ideas. And if he knew he had a commitment to do TV here in Memphis, 
He wanted him to keep his word. And that's still something we hear about these days. Are there two Vince McMahons or some of this stuff, just rumor and innuendo? Probably a little bit of both. And I think that there are these stories have grown over time and they, they've just gotten bigger and more elaborate over time. But the general, the general consensus is one of what you just heard there that, well, if you're going to do it to that guy, you'd probably do it to me. And he's not looking for that. He's looking for something that is some, someone who is good to their word. And that's probably more the norm than anything else. Let's keep it moving here. Of course, Lawler and, and Jarrett are not happy about Jimmy leaving and Jarrett's even threatening to sue Jimmy and Vince and Lawler wants Jimmy to wrestle a loser leaves town match, but Jimmy's afraid to do it because he thinks they'll hurt him because of how much they hated Vince. Put that in context. How badly was Vince McMahon hated by other promoters by the mid eighties? Oh God, tremendously. And I think especially at this time where the viewpoint of most of the promoters in the country were that they wanted to see Vince McMahon go away. Vince had, in their opinion, violated a lifelong trust of you don't come into my territory, I won't come into yours, but unless they wanted to type of a thing. And the part that everyone leaves out of that story all the time is that Vince went to the promoters that had their fiefdoms in different parts of the country and said, hey, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to work with you. Um, I've got television. I want to go out nationally with my TV. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Um, Would you be interested in being partners? Because I am going to run here. All right. So let's say, for example, you're in Detroit. You're the sheep and you think you own Detroit. I don't know which is another funny thing about the wrestling business is how promoters, because you promote it in one spot. It's like, okay, let's, let's take your business for a minute, Conrad. You're in the mortgage business. You're in Huntsville, Alabama. You have a mortgage company in Huntsville, Alabama. Well, does that mean that you are the only person that can sell mortgages in Huntsville, Alabama? Of course not. Because it's America. And there's freedom of trade, and and we have antitrust laws in this country. But in wrestling, it was different. If I promoted in Detroit, then I would I felt a that I'm the only one that could promote Detroit in Houston, Texas. Paul Bosch felt he was the only one that should ever promote in Houston, Texas, because by God, that was his town. Bill Watts was the only person that could promote in the Mid South in Tulsa, Louisiana. Vince went to each of these guys and said, hey, I'd like to either buy you out or let's work out a working relationship where we can use my TV and we'll come in, we'll co-promote shows. And to the man, with very few exceptions, Roy Shire and Mike LaBelle, um, they told Vince, we'll bury you. You come, into, you come into my territory and I'll put you out of business. And instead of worrying about their own particular area, they started worrying about, well, if Vince is going to come into my area, I'll go into Vince's. I'll go to New York. And that was the downfall of most of the promotions. Um, In Bill Watts in particular, he took his eye off the ball in home court. In Memphis, they were one of the last, you know, surviving territories. They were one of the very last to go that continued on for a very long time after Vince went national, and that was a tough nut to crack. But so Jimmy having concern, getting back to the original story, was a valid one because Vince had now come in and taken arguably their biggest heel, their biggest star on the heel side that they could bring in anybody and have instant credibility by teaming them with Jimmy Hart. And Jimmy leaving now, there's a big void, and... They knew that Jimmy would be very, very valuable to the WWF. And of course we know how true that would prove to be. Um, Jimmy gets there about a month before the first WrestleMania and his first job is working in the office with Bob Costas on getting tapes for WrestleMania. And Jimmy said, Bob wanted him to get certain tapes and the tape room was right next to where Jimmy was. 
and he could, could have gotten it in about two seconds, but he had to write up what he wanted and pass it around the office and different people had to sign off on it. And it took like three hours to do all of that. And of course we know that we've heard, you know, in, in a lot of big businesses that it, there becomes a lot of red tape. Was that the case when you first got there in 87 as well, where it felt like they were maybe, you know, some oversaturated uh, processes and procedures? I just think that it was all so new at the time that they were doing things that had never been done before. So it was, how, how do we do this? And then they would get into a routine of doing it that, okay, this is how it's going to be done now. And there was very little, how can we make it better? How can we make it more efficient? Because frankly, that was more efficient and better than what had been done previously. So it was kind of a, just a learning and growing, growing thing that more than anything else. He, uh, I mean, other than one set of Poughkeepsie TV tapings, WrestleMania one is effectively Jimmy's first show in WWE. That's pretty remarkable when you think about it, that your first show is wrestle fucking mania, right? Yeah. And you know, I think that for a lot of guys, they looked at it as another card. Here's another match. I don't think until really WrestleMania three, did people look at it like, holy shit, this is, this is a big deal. This is the super bowl. This, this really means something. So it took, I think it took till WrestleMania three before anyone really appreciated it. The first people that Jimmy manages in the company are Greg Valentine, who at the time was intercontinental champion and King Kong Bundy. So Jimmy says that, you know, he's going to ride with Greg when he first gets there. And on these car trips is where Greg would, you know, help explain how things were done in the WWF. And we, as wrestling fans have heard for a long time that, you know, the, uh, the car trips are essentially like a classroom on wheels that quote business is done in the bar, but that these long car trips are where guys really learn. Do you think that still happens today? No. I don't. I think that that's probably one of the biggest thing missing today is the camaraderie and the ability to get to know the people that you work with. Um, it was it was a classroom on wheels, just like you said, and it was something that the guys had a chance to bond. They pretty much stayed all at the same places, and who could get the best hotel rates, shit like that. So. It was, I mean, it was kind of like being in school all over again. You know, you hung out with your buddies and, and you drove to work every day. These drives might have been a few hundred miles every day. Um, and a little bit different, but at the same time, it was it was a completely different world. And that's that's where you learned. That's where you went over your matches. That's where you tried out new ideas. You got to bounce them off of people. And without that, I, I think that, um, I don't know. I, I think that that was the way that the people learned back in the day. Why do you, why don't you think it's like that now? I mean, people are still making big car trips, you know, a few times a week. Well, why is that? Because now it's just more guys of the same age. There's no sort of elder statesman in the group or what, what do you think? There's not a lot of elder statement statesmen, and I think that the way of the business, plane trips and rental cars have have changed all of that. It's just it is a it's a different business and a little bit different camaraderie. I think guys take care of themselves when they get to the towns. Those that are friends will hang out and ride together, but instead of talking about the business and talking about promos. I'm not saying that some don't do that. Some do. Guys that listen to this podcast they do. in the industry, you know, are, are the ones that are doing that, that are at least listening. And then they they take the topics that you and I discuss and dissect, and then they dissect them amongst themselves. So there are still some, but few and far between. When you were in a territory and you just wanted to get, you wanted to make that loop to make it home as many nights as you possibly could, that just left time for a different camaraderie. And now it's all about getting to the hotel and plugging in your Atari game or whatever the hell it is. 
Yes, I just said Atari. I got really excited when you said Atari. Thank you for that. You're welcome. I did that just for you, too. And Clint from Hershey. And Clint from, Clint from Hershey, yes, I've still got an Atari game. Thank you very much, Conrad. You probably got Clint from Hershey an, an Atari uh, game for Christmas, didn't you? No, I got him some. Uh, he, he had been complaining about his uh, cheap earbuds. Uh, so I got him uh, I got him some new earbuds, and he loves them. Well, that's the, does he, what does he have that would require an earbud? I mean, I know he's got ears, but. He has an iPhone. Get out of here. Yeah. He finally he had a found, flip phone last time I saw him. Well, cause he was, he was afraid of, uh, you know, joining the, uh, the dark order part in the phrase of, of Apple. Now he's on the squad. Yeah, he was, uh, that is true. He didn't want Apple to get any, I don't want to get any information on me, motherfucker. So next up, we've got, uh, Jimmy managing, uh, Bundy. We talked about Greg for a minute, but he managed Bundy even in Memphis and he's managing him here, but that doesn't last long. And Bundy soon switches to Bobby Heenan and storyline. Jimmy would trade, uh, King Kong Bundy to Bobby, the brand Heenan for Adrian Adonis and the missing link. Bundy said over the years, he didn't really like Jimmy managing him and he preferred Bobby. Do you have any insight as to why that would have been? I don't, uh, other than, you know, Bobby, I think maybe more of a traditional wrestling manager and Jimmy being a little bit more gimmicky, but good God, man. Uh, Jimmy Hart worked his ass off for all of his guys. I mean, he looked at it as these are my guys and he would take care of them as if he managed them in real life. So I would have taken either one. Yeah. I mean, two of the all time greats, uh, there without question. Um, we haven't spent a ton of time talking about, I I can't believe this is real, but we've gone a long time without talking much about the missing link. What can you tell us about the missing link? The missing link, Dewey, uh, um, Dewey was a unique cat, man. Uh, the missing link, that entire gimmick was just perfect for the time because Dewey Robertson was the gentleman that that played the missing link and he shaved his head, had a spot up on front, had a spot in the back and had a long Fu Manchu mustache and then would paint his face green and blue and different things. And he looked like a missing link. So, you go back and you look at characters of, of the past and the wrestling business of who you believed. And as a kid that you might've actually been afraid of, if they were a heel, the missing link fit that bill because he had a look in his eyes and he was crazy. He didn't look like anybody that you see walking around, you know, the streets of Hoboken and he played it to the hill. So when Dewey came in, he, uh, I think he actually started with Bobby Heenan and then went to Jimmy. I could have that backwards as well, but there was a lot of musical chairs with the managers back in those days, but the link was a character that everywhere he went, he would capture the imagination of the audience because people would buy him as a heel. And we actually turned him into a baby face in the mid South and they bought him as a baby face because of his manager dark journey at the time. And and you, you bought it for whatever reason. And that was the power of Dewey Robertson and and that character, but it was a unique character that I thought should have gone and done a lot better in New York, but Dewey just couldn't take the travel. Fascinating. Well, let's talk about, uh, Adonis. Adrian would eventually turn into adorable Adrian Adonis. what do you think of that gimmick? Total transformation from what he'd been doing previously. He used to wear the leather jacket to the ring, had black hair, and then, you know, obviously gained some weight and he's going to tie his hair blonde and the presentation is totally different. And it was because it was totally different. It was something that everyone immediately had an opinion on and a Adonis, from my understanding, and this is coming from uh, from Adrian himself, in the very little that I was around Adrian, loved the gimmick and loved the transformation. And I think a lot of people saw it as, 
oh, well, that was Vince's way of getting back at Adrian because he had gained weight. The flip side of that was this was a way of reintroducing Adrian in a new character, in a different character, that frankly he embraced and took over the top so that people would be talking about it. And that's what Adrian Adonis did best. So you didn't view it as any sort of rib or humiliation or whatever. Cause you know, that's always, anytime somebody gets a gimmick, that's just not, they're a badass killer. Somebody in the background is going to say, oh, they're doing this to embarrass. Him. Which is just silly. I mean, they're, they're being embarrassed all the way to the bank every Friday. Uh, Jimmy is then given Jim Neidhart to manage. And then Bret Hart was put with them after he requested to turn heel and be put in a tag team with Jim. And Jimmy has said that one time they were at a show and he saw a fan holding up a sign that said, I love the Hart foundation. And Jimmy thought that was the perfect name. And he told officials he wanted to use the name, uh, but they told him they'd been sued because there was already a charity called Hart foundation, H E A R T. But Jimmy said that they spell their name H R. H a R T. So they were able to use it. Uh, and of course this is going to be the thing that he's probably most well known for first in the company. What can you tell us about the early formation of the heart foundation? Obviously it wasn't there, but I've heard the stories, you know, from, from Jimmy and from Neidhart and Brett, and it was a match made in heaven. Here's Neidhart, Brett Hart, and Jimmy Hart. And it all made sense. Neidhart and Brett on their own, especially in the early years, didn't have a whole lot of personality. So you throw in there kind of the over-the-top, effervescent, megaphone-wielding Jimmy Hart to get out there and, hey, baby, I'm going to tell you something, baby, the Hart Foundation is coming down. down." It, It gave them their personality. Bringing it all together as the Hart Foundation, in my opinion, had... Brett and Neidhart not had Jimmy Hart as a manager early on. I don't know that either one of them would have reached the success that they did in later years. Uh, January 26, 1987, right before you were in the Hart foundation would beat the British Bulldogs to win the tag titles. Dynamite kid had badly injured his back before this and, and is out. But Vince wants him to come back and drop the titles to Nikolai and Iron Sheik. Dynamite refuses says I'll only drop them to the heart foundation. That's all. According to legend dynamite is so badly injured that Davey has to piggyback carrying him to the ring that night. The hearts attack him. So dynamite dynamite could lay on the floor selling during the match and not have to work during the match. Danny Davis would let the hearts blatantly cheat against Davey boy. And because of that president, Jack Tunney would strip him of his ability to, uh, be an official and be a manager. Uh, and then he becomes a wrestler and is managed by Jimmy. What did you think of uh, the rather interesting way the Bulldogs would win the titles from the uh, Hart Foundation? Well, I loved it because it was such of a slow burn with Danny Davis and the heel referee. Everyone for, God, I think it was probably like a six-month, maybe even a one-year build to questioning Danny Davis and his skills as a referee and his motive as a referee per se. So when it's, you're waiting for it, you're waiting for it to come and it never comes. And then when it finally does, it was over in a big way. So I thought it was genius. Just the patience that they had to take it as long as they did. And just when you think, well, you know what? Which people thought, yeah, people in, I thought it internally, you know what? He may just be a shitty referee that <laughs> they like to pick on. Um, so the turn to me, I thought worked really well. And without having to do anything, dangerous Danny Davis had, had a character and was hated by everyone universally and didn't, hadn't done really one thing other than be a shitty referee. Uh, we should mention that, uh, in 86, we circle back here, Jimmy even manages the funk brothers, Terry and Haas funk, who was Dory funk jr. Chat me up. Do you know why Terry got to keep his name, but Dory had to change his name to Haas. Is it because of his father who was a wrestler? I don't know. 
And because Vince liked the name Funk, you know, he brought in Jimmy Jack Funk. I, I really and truly do not know what the hell. And that's something I should know being such a fan of the Funks and spending so much time with Dory after the fact and Terry. Uh, it may it may have just been, I know Vince did, wasn't fond of juniors, didn't want a Dory Funk Jr., but he sure as hell could have been Dory Funk to the rest of the world. I don't think anybody would have batted an eye. But he did look like a hoss funk. July 12th, 1986, Jimmy wins a battle royale at Madison Square Garden for 50 grand. Uh, I guess we should mention somewhere in here that Jimmy was really starting to or come into his own as a manager in terms of his presentation. He's wearing colorful jackets, usually different ones for every guy he manages. He's talking through a megaphone. He's getting lots of gimmicks here. Did you ever hear from Jimmy about, you know, the wardrobe changes or the megaphone and, and how this all came to be part of his act and presentation? Cause they're iconic. Even to this day, when you think of Jimmy Hart, you think of the crazy jacket and you think of the megaphone, the credit all goes to Jimmy Hart in that regard, because Jimmy was the guy that looked at, okay, if I'm going to be managing the Hart foundation, I need to have a look for the Hart foundation. If I'm going to be managing Greg the Hammer Valentine, again, heart-themed, then I need to have my own Valentine deal. If I'm going to be with Dino Bravo, I need to have the Florida Lease all over. Uh, the Nasty Boys all go all nasty get up. Whatever it was, that was Jimmy Hart. Jimmy wanted each of his teams or his individuals all to have a unique persona. And for him not to just be Jimmy Hart the same for all of them, that Jimmy could be a chameleon and be a manager just for that guy or just for that team in that particular situation. And that's what made Jimmy different. He, he would become a part of whoever it was that he was managing. Let's talk about the honky tonk, man. He comes into the WWF as a baby face. He's a friend of Hulk Hogan's, at least in storyline, very quickly turned heel and put with Jimmy. I understand why they would put him with Jimmy. That I guess makes sense, but let's talk briefly about honky tonk, man. Why do you think they turned him so quickly? Cause he wasn't getting over. It, does, it was as simple as that. They, they, I think in Vince's head, saw honky tonk man as this huge baby face that was coming in as Hulk Hogan's buddy. So instantly he'd be a baby face and everyone would love him. He's just a honky tonk man, baby. But it was so over the top and in a very arrogant way, the audience puked him up and they had no choice but to turn him. Boy, there's like three or four things I could say there. Uh, let's talk about Jimmy in Memphis. He managed honky and Kevin Sullivan there as a tag team, but he's not the first pick. Uh, for Vince McMahon's manager of choice for honky tonk man. Apparently it's Mr. Fuji, but honky didn't want that. So they put him with Jimmy instead. How different would the honky tonk man character have been with <laughs> fucking Mr. Fuji? Uh, honky tonky man. Yes. Very, very nice. <laughs> He's going to shake a rattle roll. You, yeah, that would have been the drizzling shits. That's the worst Mr. Fuji impression I've ever heard. Thank you very much. Uh, June 2nd, 1987, Honky would beat the uh, um, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat for the Intercontinental title. And there's this big infatuation uh, with Butch Reed uh, lately that I guess people are just not coming around to realize that Butch Reed invented Netflix. And um, Butch actually, Butch was a big part of Apple computers. I didn't know there that. Were, yeah, there, there were, you know, Steve Jobs, the other guy, and Butch Reed. And it was, it was a threesome and Butch was going to be the silent partner when he went to Florida where he got over like a motherfucker. And he said, you know what guys, I've got enough money. I've got an idea for this whole Netflix thing. You guys go ahead and take it. Cause I, I he didn't need it at the time. He was over like a motherfucker in Florida. I don't know that you saw this, but, uh, over the holidays, uh, Butch Reed, 
because uh, he's still with us as well. He should be celebrated. He, he recently visited uh, for the holiday, the Virgin islands, and now they're just the islands. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, let's get he back bought to them that. too. Oh yeah. I read that too. I believe that. I mean, with all that money he's got, I mean, I don't know that you know that, but he helped broker the deal for Vince McMahon to, uh, get the XFL back on TV. I mean, of course you were probably at the meeting, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, so Ricky is supposed to lose the intercontinental title here to butch Reed, but butch Reed was busy inventing Netflix that day. Uh, so he no showed, uh, knowing that, you know, his fortune was right around the corner. So they needed someone to beat Ricky and take the belt off of him because Ricky needed time off. And supposedly Hulk and Vince are talking about it in the hallway and honky walks by and supposedly Hulk said, what about him? And that's the legend of how the greatest intercontinental champion of all time came to be. How much of that do you believe is rumor and innuendo? I think it's probably 50%. I think that there may be some portions of that that might've actually happened. Um, but it probably has grown into a bigger story than it actually was. Well, we know that hockey is going to go on to be the greatest intercontinental champion of all time. Um, let's keep all on. time, baby, all time. Honky starts doing a feud with, uh, the macho man, Randy Savage, which is what effectively turns Randy baby face. And, uh, Jimmy said that one time honky did a, a dance in front of Elizabeth and it sent Randy off and honky tried to explain it was just Elvis type dance move. And, and that caused some problems between them. And because of that, honky refused to drop the title to Randy. Now this is all new wrinkles of stuff I hadn't heard before. That supposedly there was a real life situation because honky was doing some sort of Elvis impression dance. And I guess Randy thought he's trying to get with Elizabeth in real life. I'd never heard this before. Had you heard this before? Uh, no, I haven't heard this before. Jimmy says that, uh, eventually he would be the one who helped get Randy into the company. That's worth a rewind. Randy's working in Memphis. Jimmy gets a hold of him, tells him Vince really wants him in the company. And Randy and Jimmy meet the next day. And Jimmy gives him George Scott's number, and the rest is history. Talk to us a little that bit. That part about, is true. Talk to us a little bit about your recollection, because I know that story's been retold a lot. But Savage was a little paranoid. And we've talked about that here on the show. But even about this call coming in, right? Well, yeah. But it, yes and no. It, it was Randy could be very suspicious and just not very trustworthy of anybody. So Randy, you know, looking at anything, first of all, I doesn't want to be a butt of a joke. And if somebody's ribbing him, he, you know, you don't rib Randy and Jimmy Hart coming in because they had both been in Memphis at the same time. Uh, you know, Randy has told me that Jimmy came to him basically for whatever reason, Randy took it as the gospel and they got together, but it was Jimmy Hart who vouched for Randy Savage, having worked with him for only a little bit in Memphis. Um, and then, as they say, you know, the, the rest is history and got Vince to take the chance on the macho man and got Randy to take the chance on Vince. And got everybody together and the rest of, huh? Yeah, freak out first name, my two last name, man. Uh -huh, it's on my boots and my ass. WrestleMania three, Jimmy's involved in three matches at the show. His first appearance is with adorable Adrian Adonis, who's taken on Roddy Piper. Then comes the six man with the Heart Foundation of Danny Davis on one side versus the Bulldogs and Tito Santana on the other. The third appearance on the show is honky tonk and Jake, the snake Roberts. Of course, Jake has Alex Cooper in his corner. And after the match, Jimmy's left alone in the ring where Roberts and Cooper team up to scare him with the pet snake, Damien pretty prime time moment here for Jimmy and biggest wrestling card of all time. And Jimmy's not on it once he's on it three times. Not a bad gig three times and probably worth about 75% of a payoff. <laughs> Uh, in 1987, Jimmy would manage the WWF women's tag team champions, Judy Martin and Leilani Kai, known as the glamor girls. And, uh, they're most famously going to feud with a Japanese team that 
has gone to become an internet wrestling legend, the jumping bomb angels. These ta- women's tag titles from these days don't get talked about a lot. What's your favorite women's tag team championship match from 1987? It was, it was the one at Boston gardens that time over the summer when the walls were sweating. There you go. It was so fucking hot. 87 is a banner year for Jimmy as I mean, we couldn't have laid it out any plainer. Uh, he wins pro wrestling illustrated's manager of the year as he should have. Did you guys in the office? I mean, this was like something Fink would have kept up with, but anybody else keep up with anything from pro wrestling illustrated or what was the relationship like with the quote unquote after bags? Uh, there was none because WWF had their own magazine. So the concentration was put on their own periodical and just making that all that it could be. Um, the rest of it, yeah, they were out there, but it wasn't it wasn't taken seriously. All that was made up horse shit anyway. So at least have our own made up horse shit. Wait, what are you saying was made up? The wrestler and inside wrestling and pro wrestling illustrated. No way, dude. I'm telling you, I know it hurts. But you know, remember when they used to have the picture phone interviews? Those were real interviews, yeah. They weren't. What what does that mean? They had a guy in Memphis interviewing Jerry Lawler and another guy in Los Angeles interviewing Dr. Jerry Graham. They weren't on a picture phone, man. They didn't even speak. Oh, fuck. Yeah. WrestleMania four. Let's fast forward. Jimmy would receive a haircut from Brutus, the barber beefcake after interview interfering rather in the intercontinental championship match between beefcake and hockey. And he helps hockey retain the title by getting DQ'd. Later in the year, the Rougeau brothers would turn heel and they're then renamed the fabulous Rougeau brothers and given Jimmy as their manager and the heart foundation would fire Jimmy as a manager and then turn babyface in late 88. And then Jimmy would manage the Rougeau brothers to feud with his former team. And the angle was that heart still retained managerial rights to his uh, former team. And he gave a portion of that to the Rougeaus, uh, which is sort of interesting. Uh, why is it decided in this era to turn the heart foundation into baby faces? Tried something new and felt that they had a little bit of a, a baby face tinge to them already. It was especially at that time with the Rougeaus who you would think, Oh my God, two good looking young guys. They would be perfect baby faces, but the American audiences just did not care for the Rougeaus. And putting Jimmy with them and then doing that. We're all American boys, which Jimmy Hart wrote and Jimmy Hart recorded with the Rougeaus doing the vocals for it. Got so much heat because now you were seeing how I think that the American audience saw the Rougeaus. They were foreigners. God damn it. Gladys. Them fucking goddamn foreigners from, I don't know, Montreal. It's gotta be some country. Far, far away, probably in Russia. Just that's the way that the fucking Rougeaus are viewed. So let's make them all American boys. Okay. Uh, SummerSlam 88, Jimmy is going to accompany Demolition and Mr. Fuji to help retain the tag titles against the Hart Foundation. Axe would use Hart's megaphone as a foreign object, hit Bret Hart in the head with it for the win. I guess we should mention, since we mentioned at the top of the show that Jimmy actually wrote the Rougeau's theme music, which is a very memorable entrance song. Some say one of the best in history. Chat me up, Bruce. Do you have a, uh, a, a little bit in you to sing the fabulous Rougeau theme song, Jimmy Hart style for us. We're all American boy. That's all I know about it, but I can do. He's just a common man. Trying to do the best he can. And then there was, uh, if you ever take a trip down to Cobb County, Georgia, you better be where in a boss man. Yeah. As a reminder, he did honky tonk man. He did Jimmy Snuka. He did Brutus, the barber beefcake. He did the rockers, he did the heart foundation. He did crush. He did dusty roads. He did Legion of doom. He did the nasty boys. He did Ted DiBiase. He did the Mountie. He did Shawn Michaels. He's rolling, dude. I did most of those with him. 
He also helped uh, come up with some of the theme songs for some of the shows, uh, like SummerSlam 88. I think they would even reuse that for some early Royal Rumbles. I think he did WrestleMania 6, which was used on a few other WrestleManias. In this era, I mean, when you got Jimmy Hart and you got Jim Johnston, you ha- you guys have no equal when it comes to theme songs in wrestling. No, we don't. And the to me, the difference was is is Jim Johnston would get into a a groove and a sameness to it, where I think that Jimmy Hart was able to. It's like when you get a good author of a book who can adapt the personality of the person they're writing about. And when you read it, it sounds as if it's that person's voice. And Jimmy Hart was able to do that, I think, in a lot of the music that he wrote, especially in the lyrics that he wrote, that they were different. And it didn't always sound like, hey, it's the same artist doing it. But Jimmy Hart, along with his partner, um, his partner's name was Jimmy, too. And damn it, his name slips my mind at this point. Um, but they used to come and bring a little keyboard and a guitar and we would sit in the back in the pre-tape room and just write songs, write lyrics. They would play and Jimmy and I would sit there and come up with lyrics. And that was pretty damn cool for a kid from Houston, Texas to be able to sit there and Jimmy would always be like, Hey baby, I, you know, I told him you were there with me, you know, give me your credit, baby. You know, just, uh, Jimmy didn't get credit. I didn't get credit. Neither one of us cared. It was just fun to, to hear the songs and, and to do that. In the late eighties, Jimmy released a music album, uh, also on cassette tape titled outrageous conduct. And the release consisted of comical songs done in character, like Barbara Streisand's nose and eat your heart out. Rick Springfield. And in 1995, Hulk Hogan released an album called Hulk rules. Uh, Jimmy, as well as Hogan's then wife, Linda, were a part of the band, the wrestling boot band helped write and sing many of the, uh, album songs. What other jobs has Jimmy done behind the scenes that we might not have heard about besides, you know, the musical themes and then being, you know, an on-screen manager. Cause I know he did a lot of promotional work for the companies as well. You name it, Jimmy did it. And if if it even entailed going out and hanging up posters, that's what Jimmy Hart did. Jimmy was a walking, talking billboard that loved promotion and was a true promoter at heart. So for Jimmy, he was on all the time and there was nothing that he loved more than to promote wrestling and promote himself and to get out there and do whatever needed to be done and you never had to worry about jimmy embarrassing you or the company or himself uh he didn't drink didn't smoke didn't do drugs and was very reliable and conscientious if you needed something to be done you told jimmy that this is what we need to get done and you could go to bed knowing it was going to get done Jimmy was the Rougeau manager when Jacques attacked Dynamite Kid backstage and punched him, punched him in the mouth with a roll of quarters. Earlier that day, Vince had a meeting with everyone and he told Jimmy to get them. And when Jimmy found them, I told him they weren't going to the meeting. And, uh, if they don't see him again, what a great manager he had been. And Jimmy asked if they were leaving and they said they couldn't say, but they wanted him to know what a great manager he had been for them. And of course, as we know, they're out of here in 89, Jimmy Hart would bring Dino Bravo into his stable after the departure of Frenchie Martin. Talk to us a little bit about Frenchie Martin. We haven't spent a lot of time talking about him on the show. Uh, Hey, he did a lot of time down in Puerto Rico. You know what I'm saying? Snip, snip, cut, cut. That's a pace. Hey, top of the line. Um, Frenchie was great. You know, Frenchie Martin taught me how to smoke dope in a, a commercial airliner. <laughs> what a hey, I got damn kid. You gotta go back and smoke a joint. I was like, Jesus Christ, man! You can't smoke, can't smoke a joint on the plane. Hey, come on down into the bathroom, kid. I'll show you how to do it. And I'm thinking, the fuck do I want to go in the bathroom with this crazy motherfucker? 
And we go go in the back of the plane, man, and go in one of those like the big bathrooms and shit. I go, okay, hold on, hold on, take down like that. Okay, now you light it and it goes out and out of there, the suction, the suction smoke out. Okay, yeah, we'll get fucking blasted in here. It'll be good. Oh, the things you learn on the road. Don't try that, kids. They're different now. They're different now. Sounds like somebody has checked that out. Um, there's a push-up contest going on between. I, I gave that advice one time. And somebody tried it and they got, yeah, they got stopped. But the funny thing about you know the funny thing about uh, Jimmy being with Dino Bravo is I remember the TV that he got the the news that he was going to be with Bravo and he made a comment to somebody that. Uh, he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, baby, goddamn, you know, they, they, they stuck me with Dino Bravo. And they're like, stuck you with Dino Bravo? What do you mean, Jimmy? You're stuck with Dino? You don't want to be with Dino? No, baby, that's good. That's good. Like, we're stuck, man. We're stuck. We're like glue. We're stuck. <laughs> and we just had a field day for weeks about Jimmy being stuck with Dino Bravo and, and him telling Dino, no, baby, God, I'm, I'm getting the jackets made. They're going to be made. I'm going to have them next TV. It's going to be great. Baby, I love to be stuck with you, man. God, I know this is going to be. And talking his way out of it. And I don't know what the hell he meant, but he did say stuck with Dino Bravo. Are you saying Dino Bravo sucked? I'm saying that Jimmy said he was stuck with him. It's kind of like I'm stuck with you. Thank God you are, by the way. I know it's good, baby. It's good, baby, because we're stuck together, baby. We're like, you know, like I'm rubbing your glue. What I stick goes to you. There's a push-up contest between the Ultimate Warrior and Dino Bravo, and uh, Jimmy Hart and Bravo would invite a large man from the audience to come sit on the back of the contestants, and of course, he's planted there by Jimmy, and they eventually team up against Warrior. Of course, it's Earthquake. In 1990, Jimmy would manage Earthquake in his feud against Hulk Hogan. Let's talk about, you know, since you said they stuck me with Dino Bravo, how was it decided who went with Jimmy? Did new guys sometimes request him specifically? Did he ask for guys? Is it always creative, a third party decision? How does that come together? We would usually look at, look at people and see who needed a manager and one manager wasn't overloaded too much, just personality more than anything, where they belonged and who could enhance that character. So th that's what it was and, and working with the talent as well. How much of it is just the eye test? Like, oh, I don't see him with him. Well, it's that too. I mean, it's just some of it's just a feel of if you think that the personalities are going to jive or uh, they're going to stick well together. Let's keep it moving. Uh, Jimmy's going to continue to feud with, uh, his former tag team, the heart foundation to the point that in 1990, he actually combines the honky tonk man and Greg, the hammer Valentine into the short lived dream team of rhythm and blues. Um, yeah, rhythm and blues. Let's talk about Greg, the hammer Valentine and that Rosie O'Donnell haircut. What the hell was wrong with that? Was his hair? That was the way that his hair was always cut, man. He just uh, I mean that, that added that a little job. color to it, baby. Come on, the the black hair. Come on. What's wrong with the black hair? Changing. Here was a guy who had been his whole career bleach blonde hair, same look, same everything. Change him up, put him with the honky tonk man. One's rhythm, one's blues. Came from Rick Rude, and um, it's Jesus just, Christ, man, it was great. It's just tremendous. When you go back and you look at these pictures of Greg and these Elvis shades and he's got miserable, on, he's got on this jacket. Right. And so like there's promo photos out there where he's getting ready for a survivor series and he's teaming with honky tonk, but of course honky tonk has got the full body suit on. Greg's just got the jacket on, but because he doesn't have like some sort of pant, you know, with his top. It looks like he's naked behind the guitar and it is one of the most awkward wrestling photos in history. I love it too. <laughs> it looks but like it he's was... wearing a jacket and nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. The, the guitar's hanging just right. 
just covering up the private parts of, you know, the, the blues of the blues, man, by God. But it, the, the funniest part about that whole thing was a, I thought that the gimmick was tremendous because it gave new life to Greg Valentine. And it was able to take two guys that had kind of just about hit the end of their run and made them two completely brand new characters. Now you say, okay, we didn't change honky. No, but you put honky in a team and you put honky in a team where he was the shining star with the grumpy Greg that was just happy being Greg Valentine. And then didn't want to dye his hair black and wasn't a gimmick guy, which is why it worked so well. We just rhythm and blues, baby. We should, Fresh, got no champion of all time. Both of them right here. We should mention, by the way, cause I feel like we've sort of glossed over this. Jimmy Hart's still working now. He's 76 years old. Isn't that amazing. Yeah. He, the, Jimmy. Jimmy is like Vince. He will not slow down and or stop until he is in the ground. Well, I think what's fascinating about that is Jimmy at 76 is as sharp mentally as ever. Like yes. You could not tell having a conversation with Jimmy. Like, okay, maybe you meet him in person. And you realize, oh, Jimmy's gotten a little older. Sure. He still doesn't look 76, by the way. But on the phone, you could not tell that Jimmy Hart is 76 years old. No, you think it's a rib and you're in 1980. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and and if he still had his tiki bar, which he which he sold by God, it'd be a great place to go watch a football game and drink some cold beer in a can on the beach. <laughs> Let's talk about Jimmy Hart. Uh, he still brings that up to me, by the way. What that we busted his balls about? We busted we busted his balls for a couple of weeks, and he's still like, "Hey, baby, you know I sold the tiki bar. Ain't gonna be no more you know, ice cold beer and cans or anything." Hey, thank you for that, baby. I really appreciate it, man. I sold it, made good money on it. <laughs> okay, man. You're welcome. Yeah. He, uh, let's talk about his, his diet for a minute because the rumor and innuendo and, and we wrestling fans got to peek into this when he was on legends house, he has a very peculiar diet. Tell everybody about it. Eat cheese, baked beans, and it's, cheese, it's lots of beans, lots of taters. He likes haters too. Yeah. But like, he's not, he's not going to go eat a big steak. He's not about let's, let's go have a big pile of fish or chicken. He wants beans and taters and cheese and cheese. Yeah. That's why it is. he's a simple man. And that that's, and that's all he eats folks. Yeah. He'll, he'll do. I think he does carrot sticks every once in a while, but somewhere in Jimmy Hart's pantry. There's just rows of cans of beans, baked beans. In, uh, 1991, he manages the nasty boys to defeat the heart foundation for the tag titles. This time he used a motorcycle helmet as a weapon. They would lose those belts to the Legion of doom at SummerSlam 91. He managed the natural disasters. Of course, that means he's still with earthquake, but now he's got his former opponent who was tugboat. Now he's typhoon. <laughs> to dispose of these new champions. And, uh, then he gets a new team in 1992. This is IRS and the million dollar man money Inc. They're going to defeat the LOD and their title win leads to a split between, uh, Jimmy Hart and the natural disasters who are there going to start feuding with money Inc. Uh, their biggest match ever comes of course to WrestleMania eight when money Inc retain their titles by leaving the ring and forcing a count out. In 91, he uh, was also brought in to manage the Mountie. We had a brief little intercontinental title run in early. And he did the Mountie song too. It's unbelievable how much this guy did. Uh, Probably the Mountie's most famous match though, was the match at SummerSlam with the big boss man, where you have to spend the night in a New York jail. If you lose, um, he's going to break up with money Inc in early 93 and turn face. Uh, when the team attacked Brutus, the barber beefcake and in storyline because of beefcakes, uh, facial surgeries and reconstructive, uh, surgery required after the par- parasailing accident, he's now finding himself managing Brutus, the barber beefcake and Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan is even going to come out and thank Jimmy Hart for trying to help Brutus. And now he's their manager as a result. It's an interesting little character twist because for years we saw, you know, anyone Hulk Hogan was 
was up against was either managed by Jimmy Hart, Slick, you know, Bobby Heenan, but now Jimmy and Hulk on the same side. Did you like it? I did. No, I don't either. And I, I want to, cause I like both of the characters, but it just doesn't, it feels like it just was one of those things that shouldn't be. It just didn't, it, it didn't feel right. Um, but yeah, it just, it just was weird after, after all those years and, and everything that, that had gone down. Um, but it also I, doesn't feel wrong either, but it just didn't feel right. WrestleMania nine, you know, what's coming Hulk and Brutus lose to money Inc. But the Hugh later in the show, Hogan accepts the impromptu challenge for Mr. Fuji, the manager of the new champ, Yokozuna, who just defeated Bret Hart for the belt. Hogan then defeats Yokozuna to win the title in mere seconds. This is the second time that Jimmy has managed the world champion in his eight years in the WWF. Uh, at King of the Ring, Jimmy's in Hogan's corner. He loses the world title back to Yokozuna. And unfortunately, this is Jimmy's last appearance in the WWF as both he and Hulk would lose soon after. We've talked about Hulk leaving. Talk to us a little bit about Jimmy leaving. He'd been a part of the company for so long. Is this something where, you know, Vince just felt like the character had sort of run its course or was he, you know, sad to see Jimmy leave? We were sad to see Jimmy Lee because Jimmy was able to be utilized in a multitude of areas. He could do any and everything and was a great representative of the company. The reason Jimmy left was because in real life he was managing Hulk Hogan and he was helping Hulk out with all of the things that Hulk did outside of wrestling as well as wrestling and what have you. So Jimmy was wearing several hats and with Hulk not being in the company anymore, um, Jimmy couldn't do both. And while they were both in the company at the same time, it was easy for Jimmy to continue to manage Hulk there. But when, once Hulk left, Hulk wanted him on the other side and that's where Jimmy wanted to be. So more power to him. It's just, uh, it's a shame that his, his run comes to an end here. Cause it felt like he had a lot of gas left in the tank. Of course we know. He winds up being with, uh, Hulk through the WCW run 1994 through the closure in 2001. He's there the entire time. And allegedly Hulk asked Jimmy what he made in the WWF the prior year. Jimmy tells him and Hulk then said, we're about to start doing a show called thunder in paradise and asked Jimmy if he would come work for him. And two days later, Hulk gave him a cashier's check for the exact same amount that Jimmy made the prior year. So. That's motivation enough, I guess, that, hey, this isn't a hope and a prayer. This is real. This guy's going to take care of me. He delivered me my salary in a single check. Hell of a recruitment tool for Mr. Hogan, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, no shit. You know, and, and that's testament to how long they've been together and why they are together to this day. After the sale of WCW to the then rival WWF, Hart and a close group of wrestlers decide to create a wrestling organization the XWF, which I think is excitement wrestling federation. In theory, this is going to replace WCW, uh, in Oh two, Jimmy's going to restart his feud with Jerry Lawler. Um, and he's going to wrestle for the Memphis wrestling promotion here from Oh three to Oh five. He's going to lose to Jimmy Valiant in a loser eats dog food match in August of Oh three. He pops up at some big indie events here and there. And even making some appearances for Florida championship wrestling, WWE's developmental territory as a color commentator in 08, he would have lots of appearances at WrestleMania access, uh, during WrestleMania 25 and, uh, 2010, he would announce his all female wrestling promotion. Wrestlelicious would be premiering on Mav and bite TV in 2010. It would pop up at uh, pro wrestling gorilla show and. Uh, he was involved with TNA off and on from 03 to 2011. I even saw him there at some TNA shows where he was essentially, uh, an ambassador. He's out sort of carnival barking in the park, trying to get people to come to TNA. So the guy literally did anything and everything that needed to be done. And in March of 2011, it was reported that Jimmy had left TNA and re-signed with WWE to work on WrestleMania related projects. 
He made an appearance at SummerSlam in 2011 and teased that he might manage our truth. Of course, we know that didn't happen. And in 2014, he pops up on Legends House. He's on uh, the Hogan birthday celebration in 2014. In 2017, we helped uh, talk about that famous bar and tiki deck ad nauseum. We should remind you he's in the Hall of Fame. WWE put him in there in 2005, as he well deserved. And he also went into the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame in 2018. He's one of the rare guys, Bruce, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here. I've never heard anybody say a bad word about Jimmy Hart ever. And it's really hard to find somebody who seems impervious to the negativity. Because almost anybody, any other name I could throw to you, you could say, oh, well, I heard he did this. And oh, I heard that. I've never heard anything like that about Jimmy Hart ever. Well, yeah, and, and you won't. Is you'll hear people who don't like Jimmy and things of that nature, but you're not going to hear, oh, Jimmy did this, and Jimmy embarrassed himself here, or Jimmy said this and lied about that. That, I think you're very, very hard-pressed to find anybody that would come up with any of those situations because Jimmy Hart has always just been a pretty straightforward, hard-working promoter. He promotes himself. He promotes whatever company that he's working with at the time. And all you got to do is press go. And he is off to the races. What do you think his legacy is going to be in wrestling? I think that Jimmy Hart's going to go down, you know, like Bobby Heenan, who I think is the best wrestling manager of all time and Gary Hart and Jim Cornette. And then Jimmy Hart has to be in that argument. And Jimmy has to be up in that top five because of the, just the sheer number of people that he managed always on top. So I think that Jimmy's going to go down as one of the greatest managers of all time. There's no doubt about it. Well, where do you rank him all time? You know, it feels like almost everybody says Bobby Heenan is number one. Jim Cornette's number two. Is, does that make Jimmy Hart number three all time? I, I would put, you know, I see, I always throw Gary Hart in there just mm. because I, I learned a lot from Gary and he was, one of the first managers I was ever exposed to in just his psychology to this day, he could come in and, and make it work and be on top. So I always put Bobby one, Gary Hart two and corny three and Jimmy Hart would probably be number four. You got any good, uh, Jimmy Hart stories you, we can leave with today as we get ready for next week here on the show. I just always enjoyed my time with Jimmy, no matter what it was, it was Every time you saw him, it was like you hadn't seen each other in years and he was happy to see you. So I had an awful lot of fun with Jimmy throughout the years. And the most fun that I had was probably during the time that we were writing Big Boss Man music, Dusty Rhodes music. In that time where he, he taught me a lot about music and lyrics and being different. Uh, that's why Jimmy painstakingly tried to, he was still Jimmy Hart. He was still mouth of the South, but he would try and change his look for every one of his charges that he had. And that was something very important that a lot of time a manager is there to get their talent over, not to get themselves over. And Jimmy just reinforced that in, in everything he did. Well, next week, we're going to talk about somebody who didn't need any reinforcing the iron Sheik. Uh, of course, the iron Sheik just had an anniversary where he became WWF world champion. And as we know about a month later, he's going to drop it to the immortal Hulk Hogan and Hulkamania is off and running. We'll examine the ins and outs of the iron Sheik. Stay tuned. Armageddon 99 going to pop up when you least expect it. We've also got new year's revolution on tap from 2005 on January 10th on January 17th. We'll hit you with Royal rumble, 1990 on January 24th. We'll hit you with Royal rumble, 1995. And I think the episode you and I are looking forward to the most January 31st, we're going to revisit the radicals. We talked about this as one of the first early episodes of something to wrestle, but now with the benefit of the extensive research that we do on the show now compared to the way we used to when we were just freestyling it. This should be an interesting show. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. And, and again, it's, you go back and look at that. That was a really long show. That was just us rattling off a lot of things, um, off the top of our heads that we didn't 
didn't really get into. And so much of it is from, from my vantage point in that deal and getting that done at the time and, and just everything going on in, in a span of about four or five days that doesn't happen anymore. Well, but we're excited to be bringing it to you next week and every week right here. Another episode of something to wrestle. We'll get started with iron shake next week, but hit the subscribe button and be sure because you never know when Armageddon's going to pop up. Hope you had a great Christmas. Hope you have a merry new year. I got that wrong. Hope you had a merry Christmas and you have a happy new year. Bruce, I got to tell you at this time, I feel like it's about time that we just hit them with something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Have lunch with Pasha Villa in the new year. Feliz años, Navidad, Jose, cumpleaños. Yeah, I, I thought you were going to do Shaka Khan there. Shaka Khan. Well, oh, fuck. <laughs>